All right, everybody. It is now 1.02 p.m., and we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you very much for joining another installment in our Deeper Dive webinar series. If it is your first time joining us here at LOSANT, one of our webinars, welcome. And if you are a returning attendee, welcome back. We are grateful for the time and excited to have you all here with us today. Just briefly, before we begin, a few housekeeping items. For your awareness, this webinar is being recorded and the replay will be made available to you in a couple of different ways. After this webinar, we will send you an email with the link to the replay. Additionally, the webinar will be made available on LOSAN's YouTube channel, as well as on our Deeper Dive webpage. Concerning questions during today's session, Throughout the webinar, you may have questions that you'd like to ask. I would like to point out a couple of key features in the Zoom conference. You can use the Q&A feature or the chat function to post questions, and I'll be monitoring these throughout the call. At the end of the presentation, I will moderate a Q&A session with the posted questions. And now to introduce today's speakers. Again, my name is Patrick Smith, Digital Marketing Manager here at LOSAN, and I will be your host today. Also joining us today to talk about resource jobs, we have Taylor Morgan, lead software engineer at LOSANT, and Brandon Canada, our co-founder and chief product officer. Before we hop in, I'd like to do some level setting around LOSANT and our enterprise IoT platform, especially for those of you on the call that are new to LOSANT. LOSANT is an application enablement platform meaning we provide enterprises with the building blocks they need to create their own IoT applications. The platform itself consists of five components to help customers achieve that. Edge compute, devices and data sources, data visualization, visual workflow engine, and end user experiences. Our customers and partners utilize these tools to create the robust IoT applications they put in front of their end users. And now a little bit about the LOSANT customer ecosystem. LOSANT is a leader in the industrial, telecommunications, and smart environment spaces. And we've offered this platform to a range of customers, including those in the Fortune 100. So if you are interested in learning more, please reach out and we'd be happy to set up some time for a much more in-depth conversation. T to quickly set the stage around resource jobs, Today, we plan on talking about a major new feature that makes the development and ongoing management of IoT solutions much easier for a wide breadth of our users. Our first speaker today will be Taylor, whose role as lead software engineer here at LOSANT means that just like you, he is often in the weeds of the platform every single day, experimenting, building, and identifying barriers we can remove in order to continue to improve the LOSANT offering. With that in mind, he is the perfect person to set the stage around resource jobs. With that being said, I will now hand it off to Taylor to dive deep into this exciting new aspect of the LOSAN platform. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, well, like, like you said, I work on our solutions team. So we build IoT applications on top of LOSAN. And uh, that basically makes me an end user of the platform. I use it every day. Um, and one of the things that most of the applications I've worked on have in common is that they are event driven. So regardless of industry, whether it's asset tracking, condition-based maintenance, smart environments, we have something triggering a process. It may be devices that are reporting telemetry or creating alarms or just going through their life cycle, you know, connecting, but it's coming from the devices to the cloud. And when we have those events, those triggers, then we run our logic, usually through the workflow engine. We'll save the state, um, create an event, notify user, send a command to the device, some kind of combination of those things. So our workflow engine in LOSANT is designed around that. Um, in the workflow builder, actually, the whole first category of nodes is triggers. And then the rest of the nodes help us respond to those triggers, to those events. Uh, I, I think of it kind of analogously to serverless functions like AWS Lambda or Google Cloud functions. You know, they scale up, they run for a short period of time, and then they go away. And just like with serverless functions in a workflow, I'm not wanting to spin up and run some compute heavy task for half an hour. I, I don't need to. I have individual events that I'm responding to. I, I may have 100,000 of them, but each one gets its own workflow run. So LOSANT is designed around a 60 second workflow limit. Really, I, I don't even want to be close to that. Um, and in my experience, I almost never need it. 
you know, I may have like a five to 10 second process that I need to do. If I'm responding to a user or an API request, we really like to keep it down in the, you know, hundreds of milliseconds. So as someone building an IoT application, this is the model that I want. It's what fits naturally for IoT, you know, like 95% of the time. <laughs> Uh, but sometimes we do want to trigger an action in the other direction. We maybe want to run some command or some process across our fleet of devices or some other collection of resources. And it's triggered from a cloud, from the cloud, from a single event. Uh, maybe it's a button or a timer or some other trigger. Um, and if we're going across the whole collection, then it's hard to keep the total running time low because we still just have the same 60 seconds for our workflow, but now it's for our whole collection. So a lot of times when we're building an application and working on a workflow, we'll maybe have two or three test devices, maybe 10. Um, but when we're doing that, we have to just have in the back of our mind, you know, what will this look like when I have a hundred devices or a thousand data table rows? So that can be a big challenge. Um, and we really do see these use cases. There's devices that don't send their data and we have to pull it, which isn't ideal, but it's real. Uh, we may do firmware updates and where we'll send you know, a, a message, a URL of where a device should go download a package from, and then we're waiting for it to tell us that it's done. Well, now we're in asynchronous world in addition to applying it across the fleet. Or we may wanna calculate some you know, meta information about our devices on a periodic basis. Um, and sometimes we have actions that we want to take across other resources like data table rows. Uh, I know on our team, we've done a lot of asset tracking use cases. And maybe the device is telling us where it is. It's pushing the data to us. That's good. But we're also interested in adding some kind of context to that data, something like a shipment, this like idea, so that we can understand the data better. And when we do that, we tend to track those in data table rows. So we might track something like the status, you know, is it departed or in route or arrived or late? Now I, I, I can update something like that whenever the device reports, that fits into the event-driven model. But just from experience, inevitably, I end up wanting to take some action on all of those shipments or on all of those data table rows on all of those devices. And when I need to do that, that's when I have the problem um, of trying to fit everything into 60 seconds. So the main point is that each individual task or each individual item in the collection might not take a very long time, but running across the whole group is going to take time more than what a Rookflow run is designed for. So what can we do? Well, the best answer is resource jobs. That's what we're excited to show you today. That's what Brandon is gonna show you in depth. But before you look at that, I wanna show you what we've been doing um, so that you can compare and see where resource jobs fits in. Uh, in short, the answer is gonna be that we're gonna chain multiple workflow runs together, but that creates additional challenges. So let me show you a little example. This is a, a demo example. It's a little toy example, but it's based on what we actually do in production uh, for enterprise applications. So my demo here is I have 500 Starlink satellites. There's more than 500. I just picked the most recent 500 Starlink satellites and I found an API, it's n2yo.com, where I can get their ground track position, which I don't know a lot about satellites, but I'm pretty sure it's just the latitude and longitude that it most closely relates to. And I can pull where those satellites ground track position is. But unfortunately, this is a, an API that I'm not paying for I have some resource limits and I can't even do batch operations. So I can't say, give me all of these locations. I can't subscribe to get the newest updates. I have to manually go through each device and say, what is this satellite's location? So really, I just wanna do one simple thing, but I wanna do it 500 times, right? Can't do it in the workflow. I would totally run out of time. So let me show you the workflow that's powering that. Um, there's a lot of notes here. There's a lot of complexity, but almost all of this is dealing with going through the collection. Um, in fact, none of this here is fetching the data. The data is actually fetched inside of this loop node here. I won't go into too much detail, but this little section right here is either fetching the data for a, a satellite, if, if I think the satellite is good, 
But if that ever fails, then I'm going to mark it as offline or inactive. And then once a day, I want to check those again just to see if maybe it's come back online. So this little group here is fetch data from an API and save it on the device. This group is check to see if I can fetch data and mark the device as good again. And that's it. That's all I actually want to do. But the rest of this infrastructure of nodes here is around how do I do that for an unlimited number of satellites? And what I have here is in workflow storage, I build up a queue of all of the devices that I want to go through. These timers here are just periodically adding all the devices that are relevant to that queue. I'll go ahead and trigger it manually. And we'll see here, the queue builds up. It's got several hundred items in it. And then that's what this part was doing, adding items to the queue. And then this part is just processing it. And it's processing it 10 at a time. It runs through 10, and then it re-triggers itself, runs through 10, re-triggers itself all the way until it's empty. So this works. This, this is under the limits. Um, it gets through the devices. It's OK, but it's a lot of overhead for simply managing a loop. It's prone to error. It's easy to mess up this back and forth running itself process. It's difficult to extend. Um, this is the developed version of an idea of having a queue in, in workflow storage. This is like the third or fourth one of these in a row that, that I have done. Um, so some of the features here were added, like the ability to add new items to the queue while it's running, because I needed to, but that was hard to do. And I had to go rebuild it several times. So those are huge downsides for something so simple that we want, which is just take an action across a collection. So don't do this. Do not do what you see on your screen. This is how we've done it. It's not actually wrong, but it's just a huge waste of time, especially now that resource jobs are here. So keep this in mind. Take a mental snapshot of how complex this is as Brandon builds out a better alternative. And in fact, he's going to do a very similar example. It's a slightly different use case, different API, but he's still fetching state from a REST API so that you'll really be able to compare and see the difference. Brandon? Thank you, Taylor. Yeah, we, uh, we've got kind of an internal joke at Losant that, you know, Taylor and the solutions team get to do it the hard way, but they are also a really big source of inspiration. You know, as he said, he does act as the end customer. Um, they discover lots of problems that could be done in much better ways, and we roll those into first-class uh, features. And that's what we're going to talk about today with resource jobs. So um, I first want to start with a little diagram here, just kind of explaining visually like what is actually happening behind the scenes of a resource job. And we named it resource job because you are running like a long running job over a collection of resources. So the box is at the bottom labeled one, two, three. That's kind of the steps when it comes to executing a job. Number one, uh, we query the resources. Uh, what I'm going to show today is devices. We also support data table rows uh, and experience groups. And we'll be adding new types of resources uh, that are queryable as we move on. So as you get your hands on resource jobs, find some use cases for it. If there is a type of low sand resource that you would like to iterate over with a job, just let, just let us know so we can prioritize that. And then for every one of those resources that we queried, let's pretend, you know, a thousand devices for each individual one, we're going to trigger a workflow. And this is where that unit of work can be achieved for that um, specific resource. And again, what I'm going to show today is this middle one invoking an API request. Um, I'm also going to show a high level device command, but a really unique one is also creating a report. Um, you know, we do track usage information, payload information uh, on a device level. So you can iterate through all these devices or maybe the experience groups that they represent tenants in your multi-tenant application. Uh, and you can use resource jobs to, you know, build up usage reports once a month, once a quarter, whatever it might be that you're billing your customers. Yeah. And then once they're all done, uh, you can review review the results. So if you can remember what Taylor's workflow had shown, it's not all that work was in place, but you know there's still some missing pieces. It wasn't tracking success and failure of every iteration. Uh, resource jobs do that for you automatically. We build all that up automatically into a downloadable CSV file, makes it very easy to figure out what failed and where a failure might occur. 
And, if, you know, just think about this a little bit from perspective of, you know, the cloud infrastructure providers. A lot of the value we add on top of kind of, you know, the AWS or the Azures of the world is, you know, high productivity features like this. If you were to sit down and try to do this within just, you know, the raw infrastructure tools, I'm not even sure what you'd do. Uh, you, you'd have devices in some table. Maybe you'd invoke a Lambda function for each one, but, you know, not every infrastructure provider has a, a jobs or a batch concept. So even doing this in the, you know, the wealth of services provided by cloud vendors is still really complicated, which is why a big reason we're excited about this. You know, our whole value as a product here is to make things as easy as possible, uh, really reduce that time to market for IoT solutions. And we touched on this a little bit. What Taylor was showing was kind of a concept of, you know, triggering a workflow in itself. But a, a lot of times people will gravitate towards a workflow loop. Um, workflow loops have existed for a long time and you can run a loop inside a workflow. And for a very small number of resources, that, that works. However, that 60 second limit is going to be reached quite quickly. Um, resource jobs have a 60, 60 second limit per iteration. Every single resource invokes a new workflow. Uh, a loop, you're doing all of that in one workflow. So you've got 60 seconds for every iteration. And that also uh, provides an inherent limit to the maximum execution time. Resource jobs, um, you know, technically they have a 180 day execution time. I hope people don't run a job for 180 days, but really there's no maximum. This thing can run for hours, days, you know, however long it takes to get through every single resource. A uh, workflow loop, just that 60 seconds. So it doesn't matter how many resources you have, you still have to fit it in there. Uh, same with the resource count. There is no maximum number of resources that you can do for a job. And workflow loops have um, that count is constrained uh, by that per workflow timeout. Um, so if you've got maybe 10 devices, a loop will be just fine. If you're hitting an external API, that API takes a couple hundred milliseconds. You got 10 of them, maybe you add up to two seconds. Things really start getting complicated once you reach the thousand or tens of thousands of devices. Um, we've got workflow jobs uh, that run over almost 200,000 devices. They take nearly an hour to run. So uh, no maximum resource count. This one here, we mentioned asynchronous, Taylor mentioned asynchronous. I'm gonna show a, an example of this, but um, asynchronous means the actual work performed by the job is not inside that one workflow. It's it's invoking some kind of external process and then you know acknowledging that loop or finishing that work is done separately. Um, I've got an example of that. Resource jobs are built in, understanding of asynchronous tasks. Uh, workflow loops don't. Um, if you're inside a loop, the actual work you have to perform has to be inside that loop. If you have to call out somewhere and you can't continue the loop until that thing calls back with an answer, uh, there's no ability to do that. And then lastly, that um, automatic error tracking and error reporting, you would have to implement that manually. So now let's do you know the actual deeper dive portion of the webinar. I'm going to go and show an actual resource job. And the use case I'm going to show is uh, pulling weather station data, latest observation data from roughly 3,000 uh, weather stations. And these devices come from the National Weather Service. Uh, you'll notice you know, a lot of these are at airports. This is where the National Weather Service gets its weather data, and then it uses this to form those predictions. Uh, if we look at one of these devices, let's go to you know, our local airport here. These devices are made up of um, you know, these tags. Every single one, the, the important one for us is a station ID. This is a unique identifier. And this is what's actually used in that API call we'll show in a moment. And then it also has some attributes uh, to represent the actual observation data. I'm not really going to cover too much about how these devices came to be. Um, you know, they're not going to represent your solution. Uh, but, you know, it is interesting from a technical standpoint. This, these station... Uh, these stations are available. You can download them as an XML file. Uh, so they look like this. So what I did was I actually downloaded this file. I created a little script. And then just in case you're not aware of that, um, I created a script to create a CSV file representing 
um, what can be uploaded through our bulk creation tools. So I went to a device recipe. I have a recipe for my weather station up here in the corner. You can do create multiple devices. And then right here, you can upload a CSV. So this is just an interesting way uh, to create a whole bunch of devices. Um, you know, we see two primary ways devices uh, will be created within a LOSAN application. Uh, I, th I think the most common is on demand where you know, when a customer does provision their device, onboard it at that time it's created. But uh, certainly in places like smart environment where you've got a fixed set of sensors, maybe occupancy sensors, they're not really coming online, coming offline. Uh, something like that could be is a really convenient way to bulk create all of your devices up front. So that's what I've done here. I've got roughly 3,000 of them. So what we're going to be doing is iterating, using a resource job to iterate over every single one of these devices. And then we're going to hit uh, the weather.gov API, and specifically this endpoint, to request its latest observation data. So let's jump to the resource job itself. Uh, resource jobs are down here underneath the visual workflow engine at main application. Click on that, uh, you get your list of resource jobs. I've called my first one request weather data. So the thing on the right is an execution log. Um, we'll go into this in more details. I'll kick one of these off, but for now we'll kind of step through what's going on. In the query, uh, this is kind of step one in a resource job. I am selecting all of my devices that had that station ID tag. If you remember just a moment ago, I showed the device. One of the tags on every device is a station ID. And if I go into the query itself, uh, inside LOSAN, in almost every place, if you query devices by a tag, uh, but don't provide a value, we treat that as a, a wild card. So what I'm asking here is, well, give me every device that has the station ID tag, and I, I don't care about the value. So kind of a wild card there. And you see it renders as a, a star. So that's going to give me all roughly 2,900 devices. Down here in the iteration, this kind of controls the execution. Uh, we do track timeouts. So if one of these iterations is not acknowledged uh, within 60 seconds, we'll mark it as a timeout. Um, and then we can run them in serial or parallel. In this case, um, the weather API is pretty generous with, with its rate limit. So I can just run this full throttle in parallel and we can get through this job pretty quickly. Uh, the serial option, and especially combined with this delay between iterations, is excellent if your remote API might have resource limits or utilization or usage limits. So you can read your services API. It might say like, well, you can do 10 requests per second. So if you set a delay between iterations at 100 milliseconds and run them serial, um, our engine will not run your job faster than 10 times per second. But we're going to run in parallel with no delay. Context down here, this is excellent for passing um, information into the job at runtime. So if you don't want to actually change the parameters of your job, maybe your workflow can look at these and act a little different. Uh, you can also use this context information uh, as template variables when you query devices. So I'll show how to invoke a resource job from a workflow later and kind of pass in that custom context, but very powerful feature to change uh, the behavior of a resource job at runtime without changing the underlying behavior of it or configuration. So resource jobs, when they start running, what they do is uh, they trigger workflows. And in this case, I do have a workflow. I'll actually go to the workflow uh, main menu in the nav, and we can show them here. So these are just application workflows, and they use the new iteration trigger uh, to know or to be triggered when a resource job runs. This is just a little best practice I've come up with. Um, most production applications will have dozens or even hundreds of application workflows. So I prefix my workflows that are um, you know, the, the business logic behind a resource job, I just use job colon. That way, when I'm, you know, searching for my resource job workflows, I can find those quickly. So it might be a helpful way to help organize your workflows. But let's jump in here and check this resource job workflow out. So we're starting with the trigger. Um, the resource to the job iteration trigger does take a, uh, the resource job you would like to trigger from. So um, you can have as many resource jobs as you would like. You can trigger from them separately. 
what I'm going to do here for the moment is just kind of move all this out of the way, and we're just going to see what happens when we trigger this. So normally when you're developing a resource job, you're really going to want to kind of just start with, well, what, what's the data I get, and then build up from there. And this is how I normally start developing any new feature uh, within a low sand application. This debug output, seeing the payload and building up from there is very, very helpful. So let's jump back to the job. And I'm also going to show how to run this job with just that one, uh, a single test device. So I'm going to go here. Let's find a test device that I know has good data. Uh, it's our local airport. We'll copy that device ID, go into the job. And up here in the corner, there's an execute button. So you can, man you can manually execute a resource job at any time. I'm going to click that. And I'm just kind of in test mode right now. And I don't want to execute this for all roughly 3,000 devices. I'm going to wait around. I know my resource job isn't going to work. Um, but I can change this. I can go in here and say, like, Give me just the one device. And this will be remembered between uh, execution. So really nice way to iteratively develop your um, resource job. But I'm going to go in here very quickly. And I did forget to acknowledge the job. So I want to go ahead and put that in here. Just so I'm not waiting around. As if you remember, my resource job does have a 60 second timeout. So if I just did an iteration trigger and a debug. I never had it acknowledged. We're going to be waiting around for 60 seconds uh, and eventually timeout. So what I'm doing right now is I get triggered. I'm just going to acknowledge it as success, and then I'm going to debug. I just want to see what my payload is when a job triggers. Let's go back over here and execute that. Now we see the execution log. We keep pretty detailed metrics on what's going on when a job is executed. And there we go. We just We just finished it. So we had one item corresponds to our one test device. We'll go back in here. We can see just that one ID uh, and it succeeded. So if we go back to the workflow, check out the bug panel. And this is the important information. Let's uh, see here, station ID, yep. So when a resource job trigger fires, it puts its resource on the payload. So if I were to run this for 100 devices, this workflow will be triggered 100 times. Uh, each time it triggers, uh, we get whatever resource uh, is being executed for this iteration. So we get the whole device object. Now I can see well, where is the information I need to make my request. That weather service API requires the station ID as the parameter, so I know where it is. This is just a really nice way to get started. Now I've got the information I need to kind of just fill out the rest of this workflow. So what I'm going to do, we'll delete these, move the trigger back over here. We'll get this over here. So now what I'm doing is making this HTTP call. Um, that is just this API call right here. Stations, there's that station ID parameter. Just give me the latest observation data. Uh, so that's what I filled in here. Pull that from the payload. That's the path. Little pro tip there. You can um, right mouse click on these things. So station ID, if you right mouse click, you'll get a little helpful pop-up. You can copy that whole path. So if you've got some deeply nested thing, you don't have to try to retype that whole thing here. Um, and that's pretty much uh, the most important part of this. The rest of this, the user agent and the accept, that just comes from their documentation. And we're putting the result uh, back on the payload. So again, now I feel like um, I might have a good workflow or a good iteration workflow here. A little bit of error tracking at the end, checking for 404 status code. Um, you notice when I was building this, some weather stations aren't present in the API, so they come back with 404. And I acknowledge that. I go ahead and acknowledge that as true, and I just put a message, 404. Otherwise, I'm checking, you know, did I get any data back at all? I'm just checking for the existence of a temperature property. If I don't have a temperature property, um, I'm going to acknowledge this as false, put some information in the message. Uh, if I did get a temperature property, I'm making an assumption that the rest of the fields exist also, and we're recording all those to device state. So what this workflow is doing, what this resource job is doing, triggering every workflow, making the device-specific API request to my remote API, and then ultimately recording that as device state. 
So let's go ahead and save and deploy this and run this on a single device again, just to make sure we've got stuff working. Um, let's go to this device, be the one I fired on. We can see here, we've got no data. We've got all our attributes for my Cincinnati device, but we haven't got any data yet. So if this thing works correctly, we should see some attribute data populate here. So let's go back here, execute this again on my one device. We can see it's already complete with successful. Go to the job, check out the debug. And mousing over the debug panel. Uh, when you mouse over debug panel, it does highlight the path. Um, may not be uh, super obvious that that happens, but it's really helpful when kind of figuring out which path it took. So you can see here, it took the, you know, the, the good path. Uh, we did not get a 404. We did get temperature data. We recorded it as device state. Jump back to the device and we can see it already refreshed. And now we've got some barometric pressure, temperature. We've got all the data here. So this is working for one device. We're now ready to kick this off for all devices. So if we execute again, there is a nice little helper here, this reset button. That'll reset it back to the query that's configured in the job, and we can execute that. So now we're running. We see all of our devices um, in progress, nine. You'll see that um, we'll max out at 10 if we've got parallel selected. We'll run at most 10 at a time. If you're running serial, you'll see only uh, one at a time. So if we refresh this, we'll see there we've made it through 500. Uh, we've still got 10 in progress. If we go to the job itself, we'll see the workflow log is going quite quickly. And actually, I'm going to pause it right there while this is running. Because this message you'll probably encounter quite often with a resource job running in parallel. And we do get support questions from this to time, from time to time, maximum per second limit reached. This is just a display message. So behind the scenes, we're triggering this thing thousands of times. And you know, each path of my workflow results in debug uh, nodes. So we're shooting thousands of debug, we're attempting to shoot thousands of debug messages up to the browser. And we just don't want to do that. We have some you know, safety limits in place. We're, that's a ton of bandwidth we're going to use on your computer. It's a ton of um, performance for your browser just to try to display all these, and it's just not very helpful. So we do have a throttle. Now, the workflow behind the scenes still ran. Uh, that's the important takeaway. The workflow still ran just fine. Uh, we just uh, throttled the um, amount of data we'll send up to your browser. So let's go back and see where we're at. We're very close. Almost done. All right. So we got 2,000 uh, successful out of 2,000. That's great. Now I'm going to look at this CSV in a moment. But what I want to do is let's return to the job and let's look at this node again. Right now, I'm treating a 404 as a success. And that may not be what I want to do. Maybe I don't want to obscure 404 being a problem. Um, I would expect all of my devices to get a result from the API. And in this case, what I'd probably end up doing in reality is removing these devices from my application. Um, they're, they're never going to be present in the API. Um, so what I'm going to do is change this to false, which means uh, false is a failure. I'm, I'm going to fail this acknowledgement. Um, so we should see some failures. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and restart this execute this again, and we'll see how many we get 404s. And while that's running, I'm going to go down to the previous one, and we're going to check out the CSV. So inside here, and when that gets done finishing, I'll show a CSV with some failures, but I, I can take this as a moment. No, oh, there we go. We got some 404s right there. So in the result, um, we track every single resource ID and since we're iterating over devices, the resource ID is going to be device. We get the status and we get uh, when that iteration started and when it completed. So these are pretty quick. You, if you do some math here, it looks like this took all of you know 200 milliseconds to complete this iteration. Um, and you know, you'll know you see that these are going to be pretty quick, depending on kind of what the work is doing. But since we're just hitting that API, it's going to be pretty quick. And now you can see some of these status code 404s. Um, that's the message we put in here. So just a, a quick little reminder, you can add messages for iterations that succeeded and failed. Uh, it's probably more common to add a message to ones that failed, but if you do want to track you know, whatever message you might need, additional metadata with an iteration, 
uh, you can put that here in the in the status message or the uh, the message field. So when our change gets done, these will change to failed. So let's go ahead and close this and see how far we're along on our currently running one. Oh, we're done. Good. So yeah, we got um, almost all of them succeeded, but now we got 73 failures. And those are going to be those 404. So let's reopen this report. Let's zoom in a little. And so somewhere in this list of 3,000 messages are some failures. And you know, there's a couple. You don't want to scroll and find them all. This is just a little pro tip for Excel. If you click the data tab, uh, click filter, uh, all of your header rows will have a little drop down. And you can filter that by a specific value. So now we've got all the actual failures there. So if you are running resource jobs and you're getting failures, you know, just remember that it's real quick and easy in Excel to see exactly which one fails. So now we know there's the device ID that failed. There's the reason it had a 404. And now we're tracking these as failures. Okay, so what I want to do now is let's talk about asynchronous workflows. So this um, resource job that I created is what I would call, you know, synchronous. It's kicked off all the work. It was just one HTTP node is done within the workflow. Uh, but there is a, another really powerful use case for jobs, which is to invoke some asynchronous action. What I'm going to show is a device command. Maybe you're telling it to update its configuration. Um, and you have to do that over an entire fleet of devices. Maybe you build an OTA system and you, you're going to send the device a URL to a new binary to download. That device is going to go do its work. It can take you know an arbitrary amount of time, and it needs to report back when it's uh, finished. And it could report back that it failed. So the actual success is you know you don't know until the device reports back. So let's check out a different resource job that shows asynchronous. And here's the resource job. I've got a few. I've got five devices. Um, they just have a type tag called command test. And really what I, what I've got is some devices. I've got a, a little script running. They take anywhere between five to 10 seconds to, you know, perform their work, kind of mocking that out. And then they'll report back a success. So what the work is, is up to use case. Uh, but my devices, they just kind of sit around, spin for a little bit and then reply. So let's check out the workflow that's doing this work. So what's happening here is same iteration trigger. And when that gets invoked, I'm sending a device command. And what I'm, you know, the use case I'm demonstrating here is a configuration update. I'm saying, hey, all my devices, um, you know, for whatever reason, we've got an updated configuration we want to send to my entire fleet. So for every device I'm querying, I'm sending them a device command. Uh, there's the ID of the device. That Remember that device ID shows up on the payload. Um, sending it a config uh, command name, and then you know just some some command values. Um, you know these are would change based on your use case. But the most important thing to remember here is I'm sending the iteration ID. Up until now, we haven't really talked about the iteration ID or acknowledging an iteration. Um, acknowledging an iteration you can do in the same workflow or in any other workflow as long as you've got this ID. So we're sending the iteration ID down to the device. It's going to do its work, and it will send the iteration ID back to the cloud with its response. And that's what we're showing over here. When the device responds, it's responding on this custom topic. It's going to send back a message on config, and then its device ID and status. And that message that it sends back includes the iteration ID that it received. And that allows us to use this job acknowledge node uh, somewhere else. Now I've got these two uh, in the same workflow, but this line, you can copy paste this in any other workflow, uh, any other application workflow, and it would still work. They don't have to be in the same workflow like this. So let's go ahead and kickstart this workflow and we can see some, or this resource job, and we can um, we can see some uh, some data come through. Let's go there, send device command. We'll go ahead and send this to the five devices. There it got sent. We should start seeing some messages come back. There we go. Yeah, so 
like I said, we send the command. My my you know simulated devices, they just wait around for a few seconds and then they send in a reply. So here's their reply uh, on the data on the MQGT payload. They send back the iteration ID and then they just send, you know, was my action successful or not? So you can think about if it was a config update, you know, what would a device have to do? Maybe it has to write that to flash. Uh, maybe it has to do some action on the local network. Uh, if it's a firmware update, it has to apply that. There's a lot of reasons why it could fail. So it can actually, the device can send back, did I apply this correctly? If I didn't, maybe there's additional information that's a message, what failed, that you can put in the actual acknowledgement uh, message. And then this right there is that uh, iteration ID. So we send the ID down with the command, the device sends it back in its response, and that allows us to asynchronously um, perform and acknowledge these iterations. So lastly, I want to show a little bit about resource job lifecycle. Up until this moment, I've just been clicking an execute button. That can work for a lot of use cases. You set up your job and you just kind of manually run it. But uh, there's a lot of other use cases where you want to automate this and also automatically handle the results. So I've got another application workflow here showing uh, executing a resource job from within a workflow. And this is actually going to execute the um, send device command workflow that I just I just showed. So here I've got a timer and uh, every day at two o'clock in the morning, uh, New York time zone, I'm going to send this command. So maybe I need to update the configuration of the device every day at, at 2 a.m. for whatever reason. Um, for the uh, polling device data from an API, that would be a very common use case is every day, go ahead and execute the job that pulls that device data. Uh, but I, I switch it to this device command, um, so it takes doesn't take quite as long, and I can show the job complete trigger. So every day, we're going to fire this off, and then um, that's about it. Then there's a job complete trigger. So um, could take minutes. In this case, it takes a few seconds. could take hours. Whenever that job is done, uh, we have another trigger where you can receive or trigger a workflow with those results. Uh, let's go ahead and just trigger this so we can see. There's the trigger. And then in a moment, we should see all those devices when they reply with their success, the job should complete and we'll get another message come through. There it is. So down here, we have the job complete trigger. And this provides all that same information that we see in the table in the resource job execution log. So we got the Number failed, progress remaining, succeeded. In this case, it's just those five devices. They all succeeded. So we've got a nice clean report here. What I'm doing with it is two things in parallel. Um, first, we'll go down the left side. I am storing the CSV file in application files. This execution report, that is a signed URL. We store that report temporarily. We don't store it forever. We store it for seven days. So this URL you get here is signed and expires, um, and then that data won't be available after seven days. So what I'm doing here is I'm using an HTTP node to download the contents of that report, putting it on the payload. Then I'm doing a quick check, making sure my status goes 200. It's down here, working report, uh, 200. There's the actual CSV data. Then what I'm doing is creating an application file. And if we go to my files, we can see resource jobs. Um, you know, this is just a little standard. I came up with a folder for resource jobs, a folder for each one of my jobs. Then inside it, I'm creating uh, CSVs named after their unique execution ID. So there's the folder I'm putting it in. Uh, there's the file, uh, the execution ID. And then I'm just putting the report body um, as the file contents. So that's going to upload that CSV report to files and uh, Losant never automatically deletes files. So it's a great way to kind of permanently create a, a, a log of all of your resource job results. So that's uh, this path. We're just kind of backing up our results. So we've got them available. Then in parallel, I'm doing this path. This uh, probably, you know, a uh, requirement for most production use cases. Um, if your job succeeds, you know, you may not need to alert anyone. That's its normal behavior. But if it fails, in this case, if that 
execution summary has any failures, uh, you might want to alert somebody um, so that then a, a developer or somebody can come in, check out that report, see what failed and, and make any changes to um, maybe the, the research job workflow itself to handle that failure, or that might be indicator of you know something else that the resource job is invoking, but it'll at least uh, point you in the right direction. So if I do have any failures, uh, I'm, I, right now I'm just sending an email, but we've got a lot of nodes. You can create a ticket in a issue tracking system. You can send a text message if you want, but you know I'm just you know, pretend I, I'm sending an, an email to some admin. And then down here, uh, I'm sending the name of the resource job, the ID of this specific execution. And then since I have put the resource job into files, I'm actually sending that same URL uh, back in the report so that um, whoever receives this can just quickly click on that and download the report and figure out what's going on. So that's all I wanted to show today. Um, the polling device data and these kind of asynchronous device commands are two of the main use cases we see for resource jobs. Um, there is actually, you know, we do work with these cameras and uh, this is a real world scenario where all of these cameras host a little web server on them. And one of the best ways to get data off of them is to, to pull them. So you will come across a lot of devices, really nice, high quality production devices that um, is kind of going out, reaching out to each individual device and pulling the data off of them um, is, is one of the best ways to retrieve that data. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Patrick. Patrick? Thank you, Brandon. And thank you to both Taylor and Brandon for the highly informative presentations. Okay, um, before we move into the Q&A, we'd like to take a moment to make a few final call outs. First and foremost, uh, we want your feedback. Your experience working within our platform means a lot to us and to other developers. So we hope you'll help us spread the good word about the power of the LoSAN platform on review sites like you see on your screen, Captera, or G2. Next, we'd like to call attention to another exciting webinar we have coming up soon. On April 18th, we invite you to want to once again join Brandon and I, along with Andrea Ricetta, Head of Customer Success for Pro Business Unit Arduino, to learn how the Arduino Pro line of high-performance and enterprise-ready boards can be combined with LoSAN Edge Compute to accelerate time to market for your edge computing use cases. Check out the Deeper Dive page on our website to register or learn more. And now for a few additional resources. For further learning, the LoSAN documentation space is a great place to go. Visit the URL you see on the far left. For more of an interactive education, LOSAN University's combination of video training, hands-on workshops, and assessments provides the fastest way possible to gain an understanding of the LOSAN Enterprise IoT platform. To see specific hands-on tutorials, visit the second URL from your right. And last but not least, if you have a question, somebody else might have already asked it. Visit LOSAN's forums to check yourself or just to join in on the conversation. Now, let's get into some questions that we have ready for our presenters. First question that we have, if waiting for the device to reply back to a command from a job iteration and it doesn't reply back in 60 seconds or whatever that iteration time is set to, then does it automatically fail the iteration? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, yeah, so we track timeouts um, separately than you know failures. But yes, it'll automatically be handled. If you fire a message to a device and the device could be offline, who knows, or, or it could be um, you know, disconnected from the network. For any reasons, it may never reply. Um, based on that timeout number that's configured in the resource job, uh, we will automatically mark that iteration as timed out. We track failure separately. Failure is when you use that acknowledge node and explicitly say, you know, false, this failed. Those would be counted as failures. Uh, and then timeouts are tracked uh, as a different status code. But yep, everything done automatically. Thank you, Brandon. Next question. If I update a job or iteration workflow while a job is running, will the job start using the updated workflow or to start using the updated workflow on the next job run? That is, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it will immediately start using the new workflow. So it's probably not advised to modify a job's workflow while an execution is in progress, because then you're going to end up with some of your execution on one version of a workflow and some on another. Um, 
but yeah, I can definitely see people accidentally uh, falling into that scenario. So yeah, definitely don't recommend modifying a workflow while a job utilizing that workflow is in progress. Gotcha. Thank you, Brandon. Next question. Do resource jobs have any impact on my monthly payloads? Yes. Um, a resource job iteration counts as a payload. So if you are iterating over 1,000 devices, um, you will consume 1,000 payloads. Um, a lot like other payload types, it doesn't matter how many workflows you trigger. Just like if a device reported state and you triggered three workflows on that state, uh, it counts as one payload. So if for whatever reason, you did need to trigger kind of two workflows off of one resource job, um, you can do that. Still just counts as you know one payload per iteration. Great. Thank you, Brandon. And now to the last question we have in the queue right now. Any questions? Remember, throw them in the chat. We have plenty of time to talk about resource jobs. Um, is it possible to cancel an already running resource job? Yep. Um, so resource jobs can be canceled uh, directly through the user interface. Um, I find myself doing that quite often, um, especially in early development when I forget to put an acknowledge note in there and I'm waiting around for 60 seconds. Um, it will wait until all in progress iterations are complete. Uh, so if you've got a few iterations in progress and you can click cancel, those will have to complete, but it won't queue up any other iterations. The job will end after the ones in progress have completed. Great. Thank you, Brandon. And that was our last question in the queue. Uh, so thank you everyone for your great questions and to Taylor and Brandon for helping us through the discussion. With that, we will go ahead and wrap up, give you some of your time back. Uh, please be sure to connect with LOSANT via the contact information and the web URL on your screen right now. Thank you for your time and be sure to have an excellent afternoon.